Let's take a look at the animation screen. Please note that this tutorial was created on an iPad Pro using Animation Pro version 2.3. Your screens may look a little different. Each animation that you create in Animation Pro is known as a project. New projects can be created by pressing the plus button at the top left hand corner of the Animation Pro project screen. Animation Pro will ask what aspect ratio you would like to use for your animation. Aspect ratios define the shape of your animation, that is, its width in relation to its height expressed as a ratio. A 1 by 1 aspect ratio will, for example, produce a square animation. The 16 by 9 aspect ratio is the most common aspect ratio used for general video. So I'll choose that and press the green tick button to create my project. Once a project has been created, you can tap on it to open it. This will take you into the main animation screen, which is the subject of this tutorial. The big white area in the middle of the screen represents a single frame in your animation. As this is a new animation, this currently represents the first frame, which is empty. Now unless you're animating a bunch of polar bears in a snowstorm, you'll want to add some things to the frame. To do that, tap on the plus button at the top left hand corner of the screen. This will open the add menu, which contains a list of all of the things that may be added to the frame. I'll start by selecting background image or video, which will open Animation Pro's file manager, allowing me in this case to select an image from my photo library to use as the background in my frame. Now Animation Pro has been designed from the ground up for frame by frame cutout style animation. This means that you'll generally be animating figures. To explain just what a figure is, I'll open the add menu again and select figure to load one using the file manager. Animation Pro comes with a bunch of example figures to get you started. I'll thus select one of them for the purpose of this tutorial. Of course, you can always create your own, a subject that is covered in depth in the Creating Figures tutorial. So the figure I just selected is actually a little bit too big for the frame. I can adjust my view of the frame by using two fingers to pinch it. I can also use two fingers to move the frame about. Please note that the blue border defines the boundaries of the frame, that is, the area that will be captured when you export your animation. So as you can see here, pinching and moving the frame doesn't actually change what will be captured. To quickly reset the view of the frame back to its original default state, you can press the reset button at the bottom left corner of the screen as shown. Of course, if you'd actually like to adjust what's captured, you can press the button with the movie camera on it to open Animation Pro's virtual camera. Here, you can manipulate the virtual camera to zoom in on your frame, pan your frame, and rotate your frame. You can even adjust the virtual camera's depth of field to define which parts of the frame are in focus. Now I'm happy with the changes, so I can press the green tick button at the top left of the virtual camera screen to apply the changes to my frame. I'll now return to my previous discussion about figures. Standard figures will have an orange anchor point. You can select a figure by tapping on its anchor point. Once a figure has been selected, its anchor point will flash. Now figures can also be dragged about the frame by their anchor point. It's also the point about which a figure will scale or rotate etc. In Animation Pro, such figure level transformations are performed via the figure inspector, which I'll talk about shortly. The other items on the figure that look like little red lollipops with blue circles around them are the figure's item handles. You can drag these handles to move the items, in this case body parts, within the figure. Please note that some of the items within a figure may have been defined as bendable and or stretchable when the figure was created. Here the figure's tie was defined as both bendable and stretchable, which means that you can drag its handle to adjust its length, or bend it using the blue handles that appear when the item is selected. Down at the bottom of the screen, 
is the film strip. This will show thumbnails for all of the frames in your animation. Right now, because I only have one frame in my animation that hasn't been saved yet, the film strip only contains a single entry with a small green tick in the middle. The green tick indicates that the frame has been changed. I can tap on the tick to save the frame, or alternatively, press the large blue plus button as shown to save the frame and create a new one. Now the aim of frame by frame animation is to produce a sequence of frames that, when displayed in quick succession, give the impression that something is changing. So I'll adjust the figure a little on frame 2, press the big blue plus button to create a new frame, and then repeat the process a couple of more times. At this point, I have four frames in my animation. I can select any one of those frames by tapping on its thumbnail on the film strip. I can insert an additional frame between frames 1 and 2 by selecting frame 1 and pressing the plus button. I can remove a frame by swiping up on it and pressing the red delete button. And I can long press a frame's thumbnail to open a frame menu, allowing me to copy a frame and then paste it as shown. Now there's also a slider at the bottom of the screen that can be used to select a frame. By default, Animation Pro will display a scrubbing preview as you move the slider that can serve as an effective means of previewing your progress. Alternatively, you can press the play button at the bottom right of the screen to see a preview of your animation, played from the currently selected frame. Please note that this quick preview feature has been designed to produce an immediate preview of your progress by utilising the thumbnail images created when you save each frame. It doesn't, for example, include animation features that take time to calculate and render, such as lip syncing, audio positioning, or tweens. Now there's a whole lot more that you can do to figures in Animation Pro. So let's take a look. In Animation Pro, figure level operations are performed via the figure inspector. You can open the figure inspector by pressing the button with the magnifying glass on it, as shown. The figure inspector is a floating panel that can be dragged around the screen by its title bar. At the top is a select figure button. Press it to display a list of all of the figures, clones and groups that are present in the currently selected frame. Here we can see that my frame only has one figure in it. A blue border around that figure shows that it's already been selected. By tapping on the word unnamed, I can give the figure a name. Let's call him Bob. The blue button with the lock on it allows the figure to be locked. When locked, a figure's anchor point will display a picture of a lock. In this state, the figure can't be accidentally selected or moved. Now also at the top of the figure inspector is a list of categories that group all of the things that you can do to a figure into, well, categories. You can swipe these buttons to the left to reveal more categories. Alternatively, you can swipe down on them to display the full list for quick selection. So let's take a quick look at each category, starting with the transform category. The controls on this panel will allow you to scale, flip, rotate, and move a figure. The Z position dial is used to specify whether a figure appears in front of or behind other figures. The higher the Z position, the closer a figure will be to the top of the stack. Z positions are also used to determine how far in front of or behind the iPad screen figures will appear to be when an animation is rendered in 3D. In Animation Pro, most dials will display their currently selected value. Where that value has a border around it, you can tap on the value to make a precise adjustment to the value. The color category will allow you to set the color of any lines or circles in your figure. To demonstrate this, I'll add a stick figure from the stick motion collection of figures into the frame. With the stick figure selected, I can tap anywhere on the color swatch to set the colour of the lines and circles in the figure. Please note that, whenever you select a colour, Animation Pro will display lighter versions of that colour 
at the top of the panel for selection. You can also press the small blue button, as shown, to select colours by their individual RGB components. Tap on the button again to return to the swatch. At the bottom of this panel is a dial that will set the overall opacity of a figure. I can, for example, reselect Bob and turn him into a ghost by setting his opacity to 50%. Next is the tint category. It can be used to adjust existing colours within a figure, and will thus work on all of the items within a figure, not just the circles and lines. When tinting a figure, please select the blend mode first. This will determine how the selected colour will be mixed with the existing colours in the figure. Let's take a quick look. If I select the multiply blend mode and then choose a colour, Bob will be tinted as shown. The normal blend mode, on the other hand, will make all of the colours in Bob the selected colour. Please note that the strength dial at the bottom of the tint panel can also be used to set the strength of a tint. I'll now skip the next three categories, as they're covered in far more detail within the audio, lip sync and tweening video tutorials. In summary, these categories can be used to add audio to your figure for the current frame control lip syncing, where your figure contains lip syncing mouth, and control which figure properties will be tweened between this frame and the next. The Blur Distort category, as the name implies, will allow you to blur and distort a figure. Please note that the application of these effects will automatically convert your figure into an image, known as a figure proxy. When a figure proxy is displayed, the handles for the individual items in the figure will disappear. To see the handles again, and thus change your figure, tap on the figure's anchor point. The effects will be automatically reapplied the moment you select another figure or save the frame. You can also press the button at the bottom left corner of the screen with the figure on it to see a figure with all of its effects applied. Finally, to reset a distortion, you can press the reset button at the bottom of the panel as shown. Next is the Outline Glow category. I can add an outline to Bob by choosing Outline, selecting a colour, and choosing an amount. The opacity of the outline can also be selected using the dial at the bottom of the panel. Similarly, I can add a glow to Bob by selecting Glow at the top of the panel and by choosing an appropriate amount and opacity. By default, outlines and glows will appear behind the figure. I can toggle them between the front and the back of the figure, however, by pressing the buttons as shown here. The Shear Scale category will allow you to shear a figure about its x-axis, shear a figure about its y-axis, scale a figure about its x-axis, and or scale a figure about its y-axis. The Accent panel will allow you to simulate light or shadow falling upon your figure. I'll demonstrate this by adding a shadow to Bob. I'll start by choosing a dark colour and setting an amount. As you can see, Bob now has a hard shadow applied to the top of each of his body parts. I can change the angle at which the shadow is applied by turning the angle dial. The intensity dial will determine how dark the shadow is and the blur dial will set how hard the shadow appears. Similarly, I can select a light colour to simulate light falling upon him. Now accents will automatically adjust such that the simulated light or shadows always come from the selected angle. If I rotate Bob, for example, you'll see the accent change. Finally, you can see here that Bob's hands have an accent applied to the top of the images that make it look like there's bands around his wrists. To prevent that, you can turn off accents for specific body parts by tapping on their handle to display the image options pop over. Here you can turn off the accent for the selected item. The next category in the figure inspector is the highlight category. The highlight functionality came with a very early release of Animation Pro and has now effectively been replaced 
by the far more powerful accent functionality. Highlighting, however, has been retained for backwards compatibility. It thus works in much the same way as the accents do, but it's only really suitable for adding hard lighting effects to a figure. Next is motion blur, which is a big subject for which there's a dedicated video tutorial. I will, however, mention a couple of things. Firstly, motion blur simulates the blur produced by a fast-moving object. To achieve that, Animation Pro needs to calculate how a figure is changed from the previous frame to the current frame and render it multiple times while applying a directional blur. Needless to say, this sort of thing can take some time, so motion blur can't be applied in real time, meaning that motion blur effects are only added to a frame when your animation is exported. And that's why there's a little blue tick button at the top of the figure inspector. When pressed, Animation Pro will render the frame and display the result. Next are the stylize and order categories, both of which are described in more detail within the stylization video tutorial. In brief, as of version 2.3 of Animation Pro, the stylize category added the ability to add one of nine special effects to a figure, such as hexagonal pixelate, which I've selected here. The order panel allows you to specify the order in which various effects are applied to a figure. The stylization before a blur, for example, produces a very different result to a stylization performed after a blur. The final category is the clone category, which is currently disabled because I'm not currently working with a clone. For more information regarding clones, please refer to the clones video tutorial. So that was a quick introduction to the figure level transformations and effects that may be applied to a figure using the Animation Pro Figure Inspector. Of course, it may be that you only wish to change a single item, or in Bob's case, body part, within a figure. So let's now take a look at that. First, I'll need to tell Animation Pro which particular item within a figure I'd like to change. Now if the figure containing that item has not been selected, or is currently displaying a figure proxy, I'll need to start by tapping on the figure's anchor point. This will display all of the item handles within the figure. Now when I say all, I mean all of the handles for items that can be pivoted as defined when the figure was created. Figures, however, can also contain static items. Bob's mouth, for example, is static and thus does not display a handle. In order to change Bob's mouth, I'll need to make the static handles visible by pressing the button with the handle on it, as shown. Now you might ask why this is necessary. Well, in most cases, static items only exist as scaffolding within a figure. That is, to link items together. Displaying all of those handles all of the time would thus clutter the display for no real purpose. Anyway, in this case, I'd like to change Bob's head, so I'll tap on the handle that belongs to his head. This will display an options popover, the title and contents of which will change depending upon the type of item that's been selected. In this case, I've selected an image item, so an image options popover has been displayed. Now this popover will automatically disappear if I tap anywhere else on the screen. To select another item in the figure without leaving the popover, I can turn the dial at the bottom of the popover as shown. But for the purpose of this demonstration, I'll stick with Bob's head. OK, so let's now step through all of the things that you can do to an item, which is considerable. So I hope you've had your morning coffee. The Adjust button will open an image adjustment screen for Bob's head. Please note that Animation Pro will temporarily display Bob's other body parts that is, the ones that would normally appear in front of his head, with reduced transparency to make his head easier to see. On this screen I can use two fingers to drag my view of the frame, pinch or spread two fingers to reduce or enlarge my view of the frame, use a single finger to drag Bob's head relative to its handle, use the scale dials 
to enlarge or reduce the size of Bob's head. Please note that you can independently scale the image about its X or Y axis by disconnecting the lock. Rotate Bob's head by 90 degree increments using the buttons located here, or by an arbitrary amount using the dial. Adjust the Z order of Bob's head relative to his other body parts by using the buttons to move it to the back, the front, or somewhere in between using the dial. Please note that I can press the button here to display a number on each of Bob's body parts. This represents their relative Z order position where zero means that an item is displayed behind everything else. Over here, I can flip Bob's head. Now Bob doesn't have a lot going for him, but his head is quite symmetrical, so a flip in this case won't achieve much. The next button will allow me to bend Bob's head, which I'm sure he'll really appreciate. Now this button will only be available for image items that aren't already defined as bendable, that is, image items that weren't defined as bendable when the figure was created. Once the button is pressed to turn on bend mode, additional handles will appear that may be moved to bend the image. Yep, that's made a nice mess of his noggin. I can press the button again now to exit bend mode. The next button will allow me to tint Bob's head. This works in exactly the same way as the tint functionality in the figure inspector that I described earlier except that it will only tint the selected item. To make Bob's head transparent, I can rotate the opacity dial. Wow, there really isn't a brain in there. Finally, we have a bunch of switches that control which properties of the item representing Bob's head will be tweened between the previous and the current frame, or between the current frame and the next. Now you'll also find a handful of useful controls at the top of the image adjustment screen. Just to be different, I'll go through these from right to left. The first button allows the image representing Bob's head to be resampled. In Animation Pro, resampling may be used to reduce the resolution of an image. Every image that you add to a figure, and thus to a frame, will consume memory and take time to display. High resolution images will use more memory and take longer to display than low resolution images. Adding effects to high resolution images will also take longer, potentially resulting in longer export times when producing videos. So it's wise to keep your images as small as possible. The next button will display a reset menu, allowing the individual properties of the image to be reset to default values. Please note that this may not necessarily reset those values to those used when the figure was first created. Moving along, I can open an undo menu, which allows image properties to be reset to the value they had prior to opening the image adjustment screen. Over on the left hand side, we have a button containing a ticked box, which is Animation Pro's universal symbol for showing a frame preview. And finally, we can either press the red X button to exit the image adjustment screen without applying any changes, or the green tick button to exit with the changes applied. In this case, I've messed up Bob's head pretty badly, so I'll exit without applying any changes. OK, I'll tap on the handle for Bob's head again to display the image options popover. The next button, with the image of a pencil on it, will open Animation Pro's drawing view, allowing me to draw upon, or edit, the image representing Bob's head. Now the first time that I do this to an image, Animation Pro will convert that image to an Animation Pro drawing. Animation Pro drawings contain five separate layers that may be accessed via the layer button here. When an image is converted to an Animation Pro drawing, it will assume the middle layer. You can thus select layers above that layer to draw on top of the original image without changing the original image, or layers below to add content below the original image without changing it. Otherwise, you can select the middle layer if you actually want to change the image. Each layer can be made invisible or visible by tapping on the I button for that layer, or given an intermediate level of opacity via the sliders. Layers can also be dragged to merge them. 
and the edit button may be pressed to go into edit mode, allowing layers to be rearranged by dragging them. As per the animation screen, I can use two fingers to pan my view of the frame, or to enlarge or reduce its size. The thin black line around the image indicates the boundaries of the image that I can draw upon. To reset my view of the frame, I can press the reset button here, as shown. Now the dial shown here will generally allow the minimum width of the currently selected drawing tool to be selected. The next two buttons allow me to select whether I'm using my finger to draw or an Apple Pencil. Now it's important that you pick the correct button before you begin. When set to finger, for example, Apple Pencil strokes will be ignored, and vice versa. The options for many of the drawing tools will also change based upon the button selected. Let's take a look. The drawing tool is the first of the eight different tools presented here. I can tap on the drawing tool to display a list of the different drawing tools available. For this demonstration, I'll select the stylus. Now each of these drawing tools will have its own options. I can view those options by pressing the magnifying glass at the top of the screen, or by tapping on the drawing tool and selecting Display Drawing Tool Options at the bottom of the popover. Because I'm currently using my finger to draw, I see the options for the stylus that are relevant to using my finger. I can, for example, choose how a stylus stroke will start and or finish, and the ease in or ease out lengths for that stroke. If, however, I choose the Apple Pencil for drawing, the selections will change. When using an Apple Pencil, I can specify whether the size or width of a stroke will be controlled by the pressure exerted on the Apple Pencil, the tilt applied to the Apple Pencil, or not at all. Below these options, I can then specify the minimum allowed width of a stroke and the maximum allowed width. Similarly, the colour of the stroke can be driven by pressure or tilt. When either pressure or tilt is used to control the colours, two colours may be selected at the bottom of the screen. Animation Pro will graduate between these two colours based upon the pressure exerted by the pencil or its tilt. Finally, Force Threshold defines how hard I need to press the Apple Pencil before the width of the stroke begins to change. In other words, I'm given quite a lot of control over how the Apple Pencil behaves. Moving on, we have the Fill Tool. Let's take a look at the Fill Tool options. In Animation Pro, I can fill with a solid colour or a gradient by selecting the colour options here. When filling with a solid colour, I can tap on the image to fill from that point. Animation Pro will flood fill all pixels in the image from that point with the selected colour based upon the tolerance in the Fill Tool options. With the tolerance set to zero, Animation Pro will only fill adjoining pixels that exactly match the colour of the pixel at the starting point. With the tolerance set to 100%, Animation Pro will fill everything. When filling with a linear or radial gradient, I can drag my finger to specify the starting point, direction, and size of the colour transition. Next is the Eraser tool. This one's pretty simple. I can select a stroke width and use it to erase parts of the currently selected layer. The Transform tool allows the currently selected layer as a whole to be manipulated. I can move it using one finger or scale it using two fingers about its x-axis, its y-axis, or both. I can change the opacity of the layer. I can rotate the layer by 90 degree increments counterclockwise, or clockwise, using the buttons here, or by an arbitrary angle using the dial. Or I can flip the layer about its y or x-axis. When I'm done, I can press the green tick button to accept my changes, or the red X button to ignore them and return to the drawing view. The button with the picture of a finger on it allows me to select part of the currently selected layer by drawing upon it. The selection can then be cut from the layer, or copied from the layer, into a clipboard. In this case, I'll copy it. 
The image in the clipboard can then be pasted back onto the layer or another layer as shown in the drawing. Whenever a paste is performed, Animation Pro will give me the opportunity to transform the pasted image before it's applied to the selected layer. Next is the Lighten tool. The Lighten tool allows me to draw upon a layer to, well, lighten it by an amount specified in the Lighten tool options. The Darken tool does, of course, the opposite. Finally, I can select the Tint tool to tint the image on the currently selected layer using a solid or gradient colour of a given opacity. Now the remainder of the controls at the bottom of the screen relate to colours. I can choose a colour for the currently selected tool by tapping on the colour swatch. I can then select a lighter version of that colour at the bottom. Or I can press the small blue button here to make an RGB selection. The selected colour will be shown here. If I tap on it, Animation Pro will display a larger version. Now if the currently selected tool supports gradients, I can choose Gradient and then select the two endpoints of that gradient via the Colour 1 and the Colour 2 buttons shown here. Gradients can also be linear or radial. The dial at the bottom right of the screen can be used to set the opacity of a colour, and the eyedropper can be used to select the colour from the currently active layer of the drawing. That is, I can press the eyedropper button, drag my finger over the image to locate the colour that I want, and then press the eyedropper button again when I'm done. The plus button can then be used to add that selected colour to my palette for later use. The palette is a draggable list of colours at the bottom left of the screen. I can select the colour from the palette by tapping on it. I can add, subtract or change the order of the colours in the palette by pressing the palette button here as shown. This will bring up the palette editor. Now let's put a few of the things that I've just shown into practice by adding a moustache to Bob. First, I'll select the crayon drawing tool and bring up its properties to specify that the force applied to my Apple Pencil is to be used for colour selection. I'll then pick a suitable colour for light force and heavy force. I can now draw a moustache adjusting the force of the Apple Pencil as I go. Now whenever I make a change to the drawing, Animation Pro will display a back arrow with a number on it up here. This button can be used to undo changes, where the number indicates how many undos may be performed. If I undo Bob's moustache, a button with a forward arrow will appear. This is a redo button, and it can be pressed to redo my undos. Now there are a few other buttons up here that I haven't covered yet. The plus button will allow me to add various items to the currently selected layer in my drawing. I can, for example, add some text. There are also two effects that may be applied to the layer. I can, for example, blur it as shown. The red minus button will open a remove menu, allowing me to remove the image from the current layer in my drawing, or all of the images from all layers. These functions, of course, can also be performed via the layer options. I can, for example, enter edit mode in the layer options and press the small red buttons to remove the content from layers. Alternatively, I can press the Reset All button to remove the content from all of the layers. The next button opens the Substitute Item menu. Here I can substitute the selected item in the figure, in this case, Bob's head, with the original version of Bob's head the figure was saved with. Bob's head from the previous frame, Bob's head from the next frame, an image or drawing from the file manager, or I can simply clear it. Next is the play button. I can press this to see a quick preview of my animation played from the currently selected frame. This will allow me to see how well my drawing is working in relation to the rest of my animation without having to exit the Animation Pro drawing view. 
Over on the right hand side of the screen is a button with a picture of a cog on it. I can press this button to open the drawing view options. I can, for example, toggle the screen to a layout more suitable for left-handed users, or adjust the opacity of the frame shown beneath Bob's head. There's also a switch here that will display frame controls, allowing me to move from frame to frame or create new frames, whilst continuing to edit Bob's head on those frames. For more information about the settings here, please refer to the drawing topic in the Animation Pro Help. Finally, I can return to the animation screen by pressing the red X button to cancel my changes, or the green tick button to accept them. Please note that any substitutions performed whilst in the drawing view will remain even if I cancel. Now where was I? That's right, image options. I'll select Bob's head again. The clear button will replace Bob's head with a blank image. The original button will reinstate Bob's head using the image saved with his figure. Substitute will open the file manager, allowing me to select an alternate image or drawing for Bob's head. The override option applies specifically to lip syncing mouths, so at the moment it isn't enabled. To enable it, I'll use the dial at the bottom of the popover to select Bob's mouth. Now mouths are actually a group of images representing different mouth shapes. When an animation is exported, Animation Pro will automatically select the appropriate mouth shape for each frame based upon audio attached to the figure. But what if I want the mouth to take on a different appearance for a specific frame? Well, I can do that by overriding the mouth with an image selected from the file manager. Substitutions performed on a mouth, on the other hand, will allow me to substitute the mouth with a different mouth. Back to Bob's head. Let's say that I've done something to Bob's head that I'd like to replicate across a range of frames. I could go to each frame individually, select Bob's head, and make the same changes over and over again. That, however, would be extremely time consuming. An easier way to go about this is to press the Assign To button. This will allow me to specify which specific properties of Bob's head, taken from the currently selected frame, I'd like to assign to Bob's head over a given range of frames. So let's say that I'd like to take the current image for Bob's head and apply it to all frames in my animation. I can turn off everything except for images, mouths, text select all of the frames at the top of the popover, and press the green tick. Now Bob's head will have the same image in all frames. Next, I can press the key button to key Bob's head. Now this is quite similar to the assign to function. The key function, however, will create a smooth transition for given properties between the current frame referred to as the start keyframe, and another frame, referred to as the end keyframe. Let's take a look at a quick example. I'll start by going to the last frame of my animation, where I'll adjust the scale of Bob's head. At this point, Bob's head is normal in all but the last frame. To make his head progressively grow between the first and last frames, I can select the first frame, choose Bob's head and press the key button. I can then turn off all options other than the scaling options. I can select the last frame as the end key frame. And finally, I can press the green tick button. Now when I play the animation, Bob's head will grow in a smooth manner between the first and last frames. Now if you wish to create an animation that plays at 30 frames per second, you can actually animate at, say, 10 frames a second, and have Animation Pro automatically generate two additional frames between each of your frames, known as tweens, to achieve a 30 frame per second frame rate. So what does that mean? Let's say that Bob's arm is in this position in the first frame, and this position in the second. 
By default, when generating two tweens, Bob's arm will assume this position in the first tween and this position in the second. When a video of the animation is played back, you will thus see a smooth transition between the two positions rather than an abrupt jump. But what if you want an abrupt jump? Well, that's where the tween settings come in. If on frame 1 I select Bob's arm and turn off tweening of movement here, then Bob's arm won't be moved to intermediate positions in any tweens generated between frame 1 and frame 2. Now I've already spoken a little about the next section of the image options popover. Specifically, I've demonstrated how an accent could be disabled for a given item in a figure. The same, however, can also be done for highlights and motion blur. The All and None buttons, provided here, will also allow me to quickly turn on or off the highlights, accents or blurs for all of the items in a figure. And that's it for item level adjustments. So now there's just a handful of items across the top of the animation screen that I haven't covered yet. This time I'll go from left to right. The first button will exit the animation screen and take me back to the main project screen. The second button, with the plus on it, is where I can go to add content to my frame or animation. I've used it several times already to add a background image and figures to my frame. But let's step very quickly through the other options in the menu. Image as a figure can be used to add an image to your frame. It will basically create a figure with a single pivotable item containing the selected image. This feature is useful for adding props to a frame and then animating them. Mouth as a figure works in much the same way, where the figure it creates only contains a single lip-syncing mouth. Similarly, text as a figure will do the same for a line of text. Figure substitute will allow you to swap your figure for another representation of the same figure, that is, another figure that shares all of the same body parts. When creating figures in Animation Pro, you can create substitutes from existing figures that meet that requirement. These substitutes can then be swapped in and out of your animation without breaking continuity. For more information, please refer to the substitutions topic in the Animation Pro help. Clone of the selected figure will create a copy of the currently selected figure. Clones will have blue anchor points and will, well, clone everything done to the figure they've cloned. They can, however, also be configured to only clone certain properties of that parent figure. This can, for example, allow clones to mimic item movements whilst having a very different appearance. For more information, please refer to the clones topic in the Animation Pro help. Now a very specific form of clone is a shadow. Shadows can be added to figures by selecting Shadow to the selected figure from the Add menu. This will bring up a shadow wizard, which will allow me to set the shadow's angle, opacity and blur. Once created, the shadow can be dragged by its anchor point into the correct position. After that, it will automatically change whenever the figure is manipulated. The next item in the Add menu is Group. A group can be used to, well, group multiple figures together, such that a number of simple transforms, such as movements or rotations, can be performed on all of them at the same time. For more information about groups, please refer to the Groups topic in the Animation Pro help. Audio to the frame and audio to the selected figure, as the name suggests, will allow audio to be added to frames or figures. By associating audio with a frame, that audio will always start to play from that frame regardless of whether other frames are added to your animation. Audio associated with a figure will also start playing from the currently selected frame, but may also be made positional such that the audio pans automatically as the figure moves. Figure audio can also be used for lip syncing where the selected figure contains a mouth. Testing, testing, one, two, three. For more information, please refer to the audio topic in the Animation Pro help. 
figure sequence will allow me to take an animated figure, that is, a figure across a number of frames, from one animation and drop it into the current animation. This will allow animators to set up a library of figure animations, such as walk cycles, and reuse them in other animations. For more information, please refer to the sequences topic in the Animation Pro Help. Project, on the other hand, can be used to insert entire frames from one Animation Pro project into another. And you guessed it, more information on that may be found in the Inserting Projects topic in the Animation Pro Help. Finally, I can select the last option to add user tweens between the currently selected frame and the next. Now I spoke earlier about how Animation Pro can automatically generate additional frames called tweens between the frames that you create in order to achieve smoother animations at higher frame rates. There are, however, circumstances where these automatic tweens may not produce a great outcome. Consider the situation where I delete Bob from frame 2 and add another figure in to take his place. Now whilst this still looks like Bob, it's not Bob. The figure inspector, in fact, will show that it's no longer Bob. So I've basically broken Bob's continuity between frame 1 and frame 2. That is, Bob doesn't exist in frame 2, and that means that Animation Pro can no longer include Bob in the tweens created between frames 1 and 2. In other words, Bob will now cease to exist at the end of frame 1, and there'll be no representation of Bob until the imposter turns up in frame 2. So to get around this problem, I can generate my own tweens between frames 1 and 2 and make sure that either Bob, Bob's imposter, or another suitable lookalike exists in them. Please be aware, however, that once you create user tweens, you'll be setting the number of tweens in your animation in stone. That is, you'll no longer be able to adjust the number of tweens in your animation when exporting it. And yep, please refer to the tweening topic in Animation Pro's help for more information. Now I'm not going to dwell on the contents of the Remove menu too much. Suffice to say, this is where I can go to remove content from a frame or my animation. The button for the virtual camera was covered earlier in this tutorial, so I'll skip over it to the button with a picture of a camera on it. This will activate my iPad's camera, allowing me to shoot an image for the background in my frame by pressing the large round shutter button here. Animation Pro will show the captured image for two seconds before resuming the live camera feed. To focus the camera on a specific item, I can tap on the item. OK, I'm happy with that. I can now exit the camera by pressing the camera button at the top of the screen again. Now this feature can be useful for doing a little stop motion animation. So please refer to the stop motion topic in the Animation Pro Help for more information. Next is the key menu. Now earlier in this tutorial I demonstrated how an item in a figure could be keyed from a start keyframe to an end keyframe by enlarging Bob's head. Using the items in this menu it's also possible to key specific properties of the virtual camera or specific properties of an entire figure. For more information please refer to the keyframing topic in the Animation Pro Help. The last item in this menu allows me to quickly align a clone with its parent figure across a number of frames. Let's say that I have an animation containing Bob and his shadow. As I move from frame to frame, you can see that the shadow has not been aligned to Bob correctly. I can fix that by aligning the shadow in one of the frames and then assigning that alignment via the Align Clone option in the key menu. Now by default, Animation Pro will display the currently selected frame rate and frame number in a button at the top of the screen. You can long press this button to see the name of your animation project and its aspect ratio. Alternatively, you can press this button to open the bookmarks menu. Bookmarks provide a way to navigate quickly to key points in your animation. 
This can be very useful if your animation contains a large number of frames. I can add bookmarks by selecting the Add to Current Frame option here. Alternatively, I can swipe down on a frame and select the green bookmark button shown here. Now Animation Pro will display a thumbnail for each bookmark and its frame number. You can also tap here to give the bookmark a name. To go to a bookmarked frame, simply tap on a thumbnail. You can use the menu options here to remove a bookmark from the currently selected frame, or all bookmarks from your project. To remove a bookmark from another frame, I can swipe left on it and press the red delete button. Next is the undo button. This button will appear whenever a change is made to the content of a frame. When I press this button, Animation Pro will display an undo menu, allowing me to undo the changes I've made to the currently selected figure, or alternatively, all of the changes that I've made to the currently selected frame. This will return either the figure or the frame back to its last saved state. Now let's have a brief chat about audio. Whenever I add audio to a frame, or audio to a figure, Animation Pro will display audio icons on the film strip, as shown here, to indicate where that audio has been added. When I tap on one of these icons, Animation Pro will display the audio waveform on the timeline. When I tap on the icon again, Animation Pro will take me to the audio properties. Please note that I can also tap anywhere on a waveform to play the audio from that point. These icons provide a visual representation of where audio has been added to my animation, but it would be rather time consuming for animators to scroll through the film strip to locate these icons, especially for large animations. So Animation Pro effectively bookmarks all of the frames containing audio and stores that information in an audio list that I can access here. I can use this list to display audio waveforms jump to the frames where the audio was added, inspect and or change the audio properties, or play the audio. For more information, please refer to the audio and lip syncing topic in the Animation Pro Help. The next button will open the Animation Pro Clipboard. The clipboard is a storage location into which I can place a figure, a background, a frame, or camera settings. Once placed in the clipboard, these items can be pasted back into either the current or a completely different animation project. Some items such as backgrounds, frames or camera settings may also be pasted more than once. As you can see here, a background image has already been copied to the clipboard. To paste that image into the first three frames of my animation, I can select frame 1, open the clipboard, Press the small blue arrow as shown, select three frames, and press the small green tick. For more information about the Animation Pro clipboard, please refer to the clipboard topic in the help. Next is a very important button. This button opens the output menu, which allows me to export my animation, save the currently selected figure inclusive of any changes that I've made whilst animating, preview and or share an image of the current frame, or view or share the last video that I rendered for the animation. Ouch! Next, we come to the animation screen options. First, we have add modes. Now most users will use the normal add mode. In this mode, Whenever I press the big blue plus button here, Animation Pro will create a new frame that's an exact copy of the current frame. Overlay, on the other hand, only copies the figures from the current frame. This allows animators to animate over frames containing existing background images, such as those produced by adding a video as a sequence of background images. The last mode, Stop Motion, will automatically take a photo when the camera is open and the big blue plus button is pressed to create a new frame. Talking about stop motion, the orientation of the stop motion camera may be adjusted here. 
This may seem a little strange given iOS is quite capable of aligning its camera to the physical rotation of your device. But what if you want to take a photo upside down? The onion skin section allows me to simultaneously display the contents of the previous frame, the next frame, or both the previous tinted green and the next tinted red frame. This allows me to see how my current frame differs from those frames. Onion skins can either be displayed between the background image and the figures in my frame, or in front of everything. The dial here can be used to adjust the onion skin's opacity. Now Animation Pro won't force you to lock in a frame rate until an animation is exported. It will, however, require the frame rate to be specified in order to display audio waveforms correctly. So if you're trying to synchronize figure movements with audio waveforms, please ensure that the frame rate here is set to the intended export frame rate. Similarly, tweens don't technically need to be specified either. It's good practice though to specify them here such that Animation Pro can provide better previews for effects that rely on that information, such as motion blur. The display scrubbing preview switch turns the frame display shown when moving the slider at the bottom of the screen, on or off. Display Times adjusts the display at the top of the screen, such that it shows the current frame number, where it occurs in the animation in seconds, and the current duration of the animation in seconds. Similarly, it also adjusts the pop-up timing information shown here when you scroll the film strip. This is, of course, another good reason to specify the correct frame rate in the options. Finally, the Live Preview buttons allow many of the processor-intensive Animation Pro effects to be turned on or off when animating. Whenever you save a frame, Animation Pro will, by default, render all of the effects you've applied to figures and the background image, such that the thumbnail images and quick previews are as accurate as possible. But effects all take time to render, which means that saving a frame will become progressively slower as more and more effects are added to figures or the background image. So if you would prefer to animate quickly versus seeing accurate representations of the frames you're creating, you can individually turn off processor intensive effects such as tints, highlights, accents, blurs, outlines or camera depth of field. The penultimate button at the top right of the animation screen opens the Create Crop menu. This provides access to the other main features within Animation Pro, such as the figure editor. And that leaves us with the question mark button. You'll see question mark buttons scattered throughout Animation Pro. When pressed, they'll take you to the relevant help topic based upon whatever you're doing at the time. There's over 500 pages of information included in the Animation Pro help. These pages are updated with every new release of the app and thus represent the most up-to-date documentation available. So please check them out. And that's it for the animation screen. All the very best with your animations. I hope you found that as informative as I did. Thanks for watching.